200 kilometers northeast of Venezuela lies an island nation renowned for its spices, Grenada. It's made up of several islands of the Grenadine group, a small archipelago in the Lesser Antilles. Grenada is the largest island of the southern Grenadines. The northern part of the island chain belongs to the island nation St. Vincent and the Grenadines. The interior of Grenada is covered in mountains, which are the source of the island's numerous rivers. The many inactive craters point to the island's volcanic origins. Like many other islands in the Lesser Antilles, Grenada was originally settled by the Arawak, an indigenous people from Venezuela. Before the arrival of Europeans, however, the Arawak were displaced by the Caribs, who also emigrated from South America. It was these people that Christopher Columbus encountered when he discovered the island in 1498 and named it La Concepcion. It's not known where the current name Grenada comes from, but it's believed that the name was given to the island by Spanish sailors, who thought that it resembled the Andalusian city of Grenada. In the years following Grenada's discovery, the Caribs resisted attempts by Europeans to colonize the island. It wasn't until 1650 that the French managed to defeat the Caribs, with the help of their neighboring colony Martinique, after which the Caribs were practically exterminated. The capital St. George's lies on the west coast of Grenada and is one of the most beautiful cities in the Caribbean. It was founded in 1650 by the French, who named it Fort Royal. The capital and seaport soon became one of the most important naval bases in the Caribbean. It displays influences from both France and England. Traces of the 18th century French cottage style and the 19th century Victorian style can be seen in the city's architecture. The entrance to the city and its harbour is watched over by Fort George's. It was built between 1706 and 1710 by the British and named in honour of King George III. Grenada is of diverse cultural tradition. You would appreciate that as a former French colony, as a former British colony, we do have very strong European tradition, as well as African tradition, because maybe 90% of the population of thereabouts is of African descent. But we do also have a significant Indian, uh, East Indian descendants in Grenada, as well as a smaller Caucasian European descent. Like other islands in the Antilles, Grenada became a significant colonial outpost due to its suitability for growing sugarcane. The plantations were worked by slaves who were brought in from West Africa and traded for goods. Sugarcane processing plants are a reminder of the colonial era. The River Antoine Distillery is the island's oldest functioning rum distillery. It produces the Caribbean's national drink, High Proof Rum, using the same process as 200 years ago. In fact, the conveyor belts in the distillery are still powered by a water wheel. The oldest working water wheel in the Western Hemisphere was built in 1785 and still working. The Rivers Rum Distillery was acquired by the French in 1656. In 1724, an Englishman took over whose name was Captain Grant. In 1786, Mr. Grant sold the estate to John Glean and Thomas de Gale. They were both Englishmen. Until 1988, when three Grenadians went to England and buy the estate. So this estate has passed in the hands of various owners and carry over 300 years of history. The 
to you, man. Yeah, I'm The juice from the sugar cane passes through five different vessels. It's ladled from one container to the next by hand in the traditional manner. Two high proof varieties of rum are produced. The distillery began making the lighter rum, which contains 69% alcohol, a few years ago, because alcoholic beverages with more than 70% proof are considered dangerous by airlines. This is the 75% rum, that's the 69%. The 69% comes about by not taking the 75% rum for traveling. Hence the reason why we dilute it into a 69%, which is very strong. Growing sugarcane was less profitable on Grenada than on other Caribbean islands because of various natural disasters, and so nutmeg trees were introduced to the island in 1782 during the reign of King George III. Conditions proved to be ideal for growing the spice. Today the island accounts for around a third of the global production of nutmeg. The spices in Grenada defines our culture. In fact, Grenada is also known as the Spice Isle of the Caribbean. We boast one of the, we, we do have one of the widest variety of spices you can find anywhere in the world. As you'll appreciate, it's a very small island, so that you may find other countries may have larger volumes of spices. But we do have probably one of the widest variety of spices. And spices is, the, is one of the main pillars of our culture. So a cultural distinction. Um, we are the second largest producer of nutmegs in the world. And we boast probably the best quality of nutmegs. It came from Indonesia in 1843. It do very well in this type of environment. Our climatic location, 12 degrees north of the equator, is ideal for growing these type of crops. Same as cocoa. We got one of the best quality cocoa on the planet. It was brought in by the French in 1714 from Ghana. But in quantity, we cannot compete to the West African giants. Ghana, the Ivory Coast, in quality, they cannot beat us, and that is why countries like Holland, especially Switzerland, Belgium, Italy, the UK, and Japan buy our cocoa beans. Nutmeg and cocoa gradually replaced sugarcane cultivation. Cocoa and chocolate are still produced in old cocoa factories from the colonial period. It's a traditional way of doing things centuries ago, and we do it the same, same procedures. So the tray you see to our left, as the old saying goes, those who has cocoa in sun, you're always looking for rain, you can't let it get wet. Whenever it get wet, they're gonna get mold, so they push the whole tray underneath the building. And when the sun come out, they pull it back out. So that's the whole idea, it's traditional way. The Rastafarian ideology is widespread in Granada. The religious movement, which has its origins in Old Testament Christianity, began in the Caribbean in the 1930s. The Rastas are adherents of the former king of Ethiopia, Haile Selassie, who they see as the reincarnation of Jesus Christ. They live a traditional life in harmony with nature. When we say Rastafari, that is like a spiritual word, meaning we have to stand up for our rights. 
Yoruba's Rastafari is a heritage. It's like a cultural belief for people of the Ethiopian and African descent. You know, when we say Rastafari, we mean it's a culture that believe in, you know, not to be oppressed anymore. So Rastafari, this is what Rastafari meaning, as a cultural expression, meaning to be free. Well, we would say Rastafari start from established in the Caribbean around Selassie time. But when you talk about Rastafari, Rastafari is from ever since because Rastafari is the identity of um, John the Baptist. John the Baptist was a man that had locks up on his head. You know, if you read in Numbers chapter 5, they will tell you that no razor should go up on your head. Your locks in your hair should grow and you should never cut it. No men shouldn't use no razor upon the head or anything like that. Rasta is not the hairstyle or the clothes with some people, the long dread and the Rasta clothes and they eat all kind of thing. Rasta, it's a way of life. There are many things that the Caribbean has given the world. One of them are these three colors put together. Because before these three colors, before uh, the Caribbean put these colors into the world, there's no flag before Zimbabwe that had these colors. It is Bob Marley that went to Zimbabwe's um, uh, independence and, and brought the colors. So red, gold, and green is about an Afrocentric orientation or an understanding of Rasta. It is not necessarily a Jamaican color. It's not, it's not associated. Hey, you have to live Rasta. Anybody can nut up the hair. And don't comb your hair and it grows. Some people do it as a style. Rasta has nothing to do with the hairstyle. The Tivoli drummers come from the Grenadian town of Tivoli and perform a typical Afro-Caribbean style of music. Drum music was introduced to Grenada during the period of slavery. The style of drumming used by the Tivoli drummers is unique and has never been broadcast on English language television in the Caribbean. We are uh, African people. We, 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 were, we were brought here um, during the slave uh, trade. And so we have with us some music that uh, came out, out of Africa. And so we try to maintain and keep uh, some of those that uh, still exist. So it must sound like African music right now because our base, our root is, is Africa. from early time, slave time, when they were brought here, uh, they prevented the use of drum. But uh, still, people remember and pass it on from generation to generation. And today, we, uh, we have African music, but we also have our own style, what we heard from the Caribbean, that we have developed. So it is not just uh, African music in the pure African sense, but it is an aspect of African music, but it is also an aspect of uh, Caribbean music that uh, we created. Our music is uh, unique to Tivoli Jomas. It does not exist, uh, there, there is no music like what we play that exists in none of the other Caribbean islands. to have 
have a drumming group. And uh, part of what we do is to try to recapture some of the lost tradition. So it means that uh, we, we had the tradition that exists years now, and we also try to recapture that same tradition. So yes, it is uh, traditional, but it is also modern. We blend the, the traditional drumming with modern drumming that we created. The island of Kariakou is a two-hour ferry ride from Grenada. The harbour adjoins Hillsborough, the capital of Kariakou. It's the largest settlement in the smaller Grenadine Islands. Kariakou is one of the most untouched islands in the Caribbean. Tourism and high society are hardly to be seen here. Kariakou is part of the three island state known as Grenada, Kariakou and Petit Martinique. The name Kariakou comes from the language of the Caribs and means the island of reefs. The island is first mentioned in 1656 in the book Histoire des Antilles by Père de Tertre. Cariacou came under English control in 1763. The ruins of sugarcane mills are a reminder of the old plantations and slavery. The island is ringed by postcard perfect beaches. It's not for nothing that one of the major seaside areas is called Paradise Beach. The island's inhabitants live mainly from fishing, although most of the fish end up going straight from the sea to the stomach. Traditional boat building is also a significant industry. The boats are built without the aid of machinery and it takes around six months before they're seaworthy. Depends on how you are. Um, what, what, what we usually do is like we make the boat di in different shapes, different design, however the, the person wants it. Okay? So, like with this one here, this one is like is a fishing boat. So, you build it on a different scale to the, a pleasure boat. You build them various size, however the owner like it. Sometimes you do something before you start building the cabin or the any part of the boat, first thing you'll call him if he are wrong and then you ask him, well we're building the cabin this way, you like you li would you like it that way? He might tell you yes or I'm satisfied or no. I ain't like it this way, you have to put it this way, I like it this way and because you have to satisfy him because it belongs to the person. This part is for the engine room, all right? The engine room will be here. 
And then this section here would be the ice box. You catch the fish, you put it down here, you have your cover it with your ice and depends on the amount of fish or how many days you have outside and the ice start getting low, you head for shore. The wood used to construct the boats is either felled in Grenada or imported from one of the bigger islands. The boat builders choose their own timber from the forest for their boats. Well, like if you don't want to go to the bush, what happens to you? You go to Grenada. Or you call Grenada, there's a guy, guy down there who usually have a sawmill down there. You tell him what size of wood you want and he send the wood for you, like this one here, because the wood is straight. Because this boat is a flat bottom, we call it tree bottom. But like this, you have to go yourself, because you need different shape of the wood. Because in Karaku, we haven't got no steam bender. And you go to the forest and you look for the trees, bam. You use a chainsaw on it, cut it down. Charles McLawrence works on the boats together with his son. Most of the times, well, I have a son that work with me sometimes, but presently now he went to Grenada with his uncle to cut some wood to go and build another boat. The boats that are built on Kariaku are special, and people come here from islands all over the Lesser Antilles to order a new boat. But this, the, the owner of this boat is not really from Kariaku. He's from Antigua. He's an American guy that resides in Antigua. So majority of the boats you see that build here for pleasure, all after the finish, they head for Antigua. And there they have all the races and things that they usually go up there for the classics. So you usually come down here, get the boat done, and they head back to Antigua. Because at, um, there is no part in the Caribbean that you'll get a boat built, like in Caracu. Okay. They'll build boats, but not as good and pretty as what you'll get in Karyaku. The influences of many different cultures can be felt in the lives of the people on Grenada, expressed in their religion and music. They tell the story of the native people, colonialism and slavery. It's a history that can still be retraced if one takes a look beyond Granada's wonderful beaches.